Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. We've just lost 90% of our young audience out there. Who's Susan Lucci? I don't know why they're an old lady voice, but anyways. And he'd be like, oh, uh, uh, uh. Well, he, yeah, exactly. Agree, you can agree. Agree. all you want. You agree to disagree. Disney fight. <laughs> See, two dudes talking about Disney. Oh, yeah, so many viewers. We just lost so many. Viewers. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mike Butler. And I'm Mike Field. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time, or the film simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the film, or perhaps don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast. What's up? Not much. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. You ready for another round of detective films? I know. That's right. We are doing Devil in a Blue Dress, the 1995 film starring Denzel Washington. Real quick, runtime of 102 minutes, rated R, production budget of $27 million. Ah, I remember the days of $27 million budgets that had big time actors in it. Those don't exist anymore. (laughs) As it released September 29th, 1995. Opening weekend, it came and took in 5.4 million. Domestic, 16 million. Worldwide, 16. Obviously, it wasn't released internationally. And as you can see, it didn't make its budget back. So I think we want to know why it's a little, it's part of this podcast and we're saying it's forgotten. So, directed by Carl Franklin. He also directed, and I believe he wrote uh, One False Move, Out of Time, High Crimes. As I said, he wrote this one. It's based on a Walter Mosley book of the same name. Uh, the Easy Rollins. That's that's the name of uh, Denzel Washington's character in this, in the lead. He's a character in Mosley's a lot of Mosley's books, most of them. Um, but Walter Mosley also is a. I don't know if he's a creator, but he's definitely an executive producer and a writer for the show Snowfall. I was wondering about that. I was like, yeah. does he actually write it? Or I've been meaning to watch Snowfall. I have not, but I've heard great things. About I don't it. know if he's. The, I don't believe he's the creator. Gotcha. Uh, music by Elmer Bernstein. Now I'm gonna list a bunch of movies here. Oh man, I saw. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to be like, really? And I picked, I tried to pick the ones that were older, so I didn't pick any of the newer ones. Mm-hmm. He, first of all, he won one Oscar for Thoroughly Modern Millie, but he's done the Ten Commandments, To Kill a Mockingbird, Sons of Katie Elder, True Grit, The Shootist, American Werewolf in London. That's just six. I get one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. He has done a ton of stuff. Oh, he's yeah. obviously since passed away, but um, big time great. Cinematography by Tak Fujimoto. Um, pretty much done. I think he's done anything that. M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah, I was just trying to think of his name. I was picturing M. Night Shyamalan's name coming across during the signs. Like, I'm just, boom, like, that's his name. So, signs, Sixth Sense, he's also done Badlands, and he did Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Silence of the Lambs, too. Silence of the Lambs. Big time, big time cinematography. So, there's some big time names behind this movie. Starring Denzel Washington as Easy Rollins. Denzel Washington is in such films as Inside Man, Fences. He won the Oscar for uh, Best Actor in Training Day and Supporting Actor for the movie Glory. I love Glory. Glory is fantastic. Glory is an awesome film. If you have not seen it, it's an older film. It's one of Den- uh, Denzel Washington's earlier films. But if you have not seen it, please see it. Uh, Mr. Washington also came onto the scene on a little TV show called St. Elsewhere. That was both before our time, but uh, it was a big time show. And his... It's connected to every film or every uh, TV universe uh, that has ever existed. Uh, correct. Tom Sizemore is DeWitt Albright. Sizemore is in movies as Saving Private Ryan, Strange Days, which we did that uh, as an episode a couple weeks ago. Yes, we did. Pearl Harbor, Black Hawk Down. Jennifer Beals plays Daphne Monet. Uh, she is obviously famous for Flashdance, uh, but she's also in The Runaway Jury, Last Days of Disco, and I believe she's in The L Word. Not the, there's like three different versions she's of this. She's in the newest version of The okay. L Word, I believe. Yeah. And she's in Book of Eli, I saw. Yes. Denzel, she's but I don't remember who she played. I don't know either. I saw that movie once and I never went back. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it, but I also never went back. Right. Don Cheadle is Mouse Alexander. He, I, I think he is called Miles in this at some point. I think point. Miles is his real name. Yeah. I, and they, they call but him in the credits is Mouse, but he is, uh, he obviously play. he's in Iron Man 2. He plays, um, Rhodey. Rhodey. He takes over the role of Rhodey. And then he's just, so he's in every other MCU movie that you ever <laughs> see. He's also in Hotel Rwanda. He's in all the Oceans movies, 11, 12, and 13. Traffic, Boogie Nights. This movie, Devil in a Blue Dress, is the movie that made Don Cheadle, you know, Big time. He's really good. He is fantastic in this film. He was also in Colors, the Sean Penn, uh, Robert Duvall movie about the LA cops. He yes. plays one of the gangs, uh, the gangbangers or whatever like that. But And he's good in that. But this movie 
is like everyone knows this movie because of his performance and he's got a really cool character to play. So it's yes. part yeah. character, part him, but he's really good in this movie. He's got a great character to play. Absolutely. And it's really interesting. You also forgot to mention that Don Cheadle also plays Captain Planet in the uh, college shooter yeah. videos. That was after. Are, that was all they're, after. They're that, I'm sure it's funny. I'm sure it's funny. <laughs> Maury Chaykin, because we love to do Maury Chaykin films. Uh, uh, I, some, when I saw him on the credits, I was like, oh, yeah, that's why Field loves this movie. <laughs> he plays <laughs> Matthew Terrell. He's from the Nero Wolf series, Mask of Zora, which you did in Mystery Alaska. And I got to tell you, I did not know he passed away. You didn't know and that? And that's a while ago. Yeah. And we might have talked about it. We, we might have talked about it. Yeah. And I probably forgot. But I know it. And I was just like, man, that's too bad. And then I find Lisa Nicole Carson as Coretta James. She uh, was in ER, uh, the TV show, Alan McBeal as well. Life in Eve's Bayou. She hasn't done a lot lately, which I don't, I don't know why either. So before we get into everything else, it is my turn this week to give you the plot of the movie. Thank God. I'm going to. Hold on, let me sip my coffee. Are Just relax enjoy? because this film synopsis, synopsis is going to come courtesy of Google. So yeah, I, I don't. Have I to, do my own synopsis, which man. is why you sound terrible. Well, listen, man. The viewers have spoken. You are terrible. Do they think that? No, I don't know. Yes. No. Yeah. No. I do know. <laughs> Shut up. I'm doing my. I'm quit. doing my synopsis. No, you know what? You don't get to do your Google. I'm doing the synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> In late 1940s Los Angeles, Easy Rollins, played by Denzel Washington, is an unemployed black World War II veteran with few job prospects. He actually just gets laid off uh, from an airline uh, at the beginning of this movie. You don't see it, but now you realize he's laid off. At a bar, Easy meets DeWitt Albright, Tom Sizemore character, a mysterious white man looking for someone to investigate the disappearance of a missing white woman named Daphne Monet, who he suspects is hiding out in one of the city's black jazz clubs. Strapped for money and facing house payments, Easy takes the job, but soon finds himself in over his head. So immediately right there, a staple of uh, of a private investigator movie, a PI movie, is somebody who gets in over their head, which Absolutely. is clearly what happens here with Easy. Yep. Now, that's what the movie's about. And did you see this movie when it came out in the 90s? This is the first time I've ever seen this movie. Really? I Excellent. knew of this movie. Excellent. But I have never seen this movie. Excellent. So I'm curious as to your thoughts. Um, I will tell you that I like this movie. Um, I like the, I, I like the look of this film. I like the set design and production design, obviously the time period. I enjoy, we talked about Don Cheadle. I enjoy Denzel in this movie. I, there are some stuff that I'm just, it, it kind of drags a little, I think maybe in the beginning, kind of trying to set everything up, but overall I enjoy this movie. And, and the one thing that I said, my one big comment about this movie is that whether you loved it or didn't love it, and I know it didn't make any money, it deserved a sequel. It absolutely deserved a second movie. Yeah, you, you kind of set up that it's going to be a series of films toward well, the end. Well, because it's all based on a, the whole well, series I know it's of books. Based on a book, yeah, but yeah. you do kind of at the end, he, goes, he talks about how he wants to open a private investigator. Thing. Sure. Um, and also the fact that they never came back. to It's an, it's an already made series. Mm -hmm. And even if Denzel, he was a name back then. Mm -hmm. He's a bigger name, you know, a couple of years later. That's an already made series for one of the bi biggest bankable stars in the world. Just go, hey, you know, you, he could still do it now. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hey, you want to do some more Easy Rollins books? Well, this didn't do well. Well, I know that. You do it again now. No one's going to remember Devil in the Blue Dress audiences today. You no, you don't even have to hearken back that it is. He's just Easy Rollins. He's a private investigator in the 40s, 50s. Boom, done. Well, I know that ABC was planning a pilot based on the film in 98, and that obviously didn't come to fruition. And then NBC, a couple years ago, maybe four or five years ago, was going to do a series called Easy Rollins, and then that didn't happen either. So See, this is something that on TV would have to come nowadays because you'd have to deal with really big issues like racism and stuff like that, that I feel like in the 90s, you could do it a little bit, but I feel like it would be a, a it would. Oh, you mean set it in present as, day? No, no, no. You said it back in the 40s, yeah. but it would work like TV networks are a little braver now Oh, right, um, right, right. to be able to handle that kind of stuff. Well, like NYPD Blue maybe back then. Mm -hmm. but other than that, you didn't have a lot of stuff that dealt with issues like oh, this. It, I don't think this should be on. I, I honestly don't really like anything that's on network TV anymore. It should be on like, you know, like we talk about. Prime, well, we say that, but you look at NBC, Netflix. look at look at Hannibal. Yeah, and then look what happened. They never yeah, got, they they never got behind it. Yeah. It's like Aquarius as well. Yeah. It was a, a mature right. series. Which they didn't even run the last two or three episodes. They ran football. So yep. Like instead of which I like football, but still like I wanted to see the ending of Hannibal and they didn't even run. They, they tossed it in the summer somewhere where you couldn't find it. So they can say all they want about how like, you know, they want to have good content, but no, they I don't get ever that. get behind the content when it doesn't do well. But you know, if let's say if NBC was behind it, you said NBC, right? The second one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if they have the rights now, put it on your Peacock network. That's fine. But here's the thing. Just sign up for one season. 
and do one book and make it eight episodes, 10 episodes and do one season, shoot it, put it out there. If it does well, pick up a second season and do a second book. If it doesn't do well, you're done. Cut it. See you later. Just like HBO deal Watchmen. Just get rid of it. Go on, move on. Yep. Stop signing up these things for 24 episodes. And then you're expecting every episode to just be a big time network star. Well, that's what I love also about, I've mentioned it before and it works because we do a lot of detective things. Uh, Altered Carbon, mm -hmm. you know, did the first book in the series, ended it with an ending. Yeah. Left it open that if they wanted to do more se seasons, they could. And I feel like that's a good, I think a lot of, especially like the streaming services are starting to adapt that model in terms of their series, creating a finale that serves as a series finale and um, a cliffhanger for right. another season without pissing off audiences. Well, that's like the Castle Rock show, the series that I've been watching that I told you about. Like the first season of Castle Rock, I kind of, it's very difficult to get through, which we've talked we, about. We both left the last episode hanging for yeah, a long time. I know, and I finally finished it because I wa I wanted to finish it, number one. And number two, I really wanted to watch the second season with Annie Wilkes because I, I like Lizzie Kaplan and I like, I wanted to see Annie Wilkes on screen. And I'm telling you, it's really good. Well, not to get on a... Castle Rock tangent, but also that's an anthology. Sh anthology. Well, that's what I'm so saying. That's always going to be that's always going to be dependent on what you set up for, for that story, season, especially what Stephen King stuff you're bringing sure. to the forefront. Like you're right. talking about, it's got all the vampire stuff, which I really dig, and like I also really like it, Lizzie Kaplan too. Um, so I'm interested in that season. I just meant in terms of what you were saying. I, I was just relating to what you were saying before. You in terms of it. you have one ending, then you have a second season, which is a different storyline, different ending, that kind of but thing. But you're talking about all new characters and stuff, too. Well, that's what they do. Yeah. That's fine. I'm fine with that. You could both ways. Either way. I mean, yeah, because Easy Rollins well, well, one would with, have Easy Rollins. Well, that's the thing. With the exception of Easy Rollins, then you would have, you know, Mouse character, or Miles, whichever which we're going to call Which you wouldn't have to bring back if he didn't you wouldn't, work. As he, a, yeah. yeah, and then you maybe you would have one of a friend of his that's like a, a bartender or something like that. In this movie, he has a friend that's he's with at the end of the movie at that guy on the porch, like he's his buddy. Yeah. But like, you know, and there's nobody else. So you maybe have maybe two or three main returning characters, but everyone else can be no. Yep. Yeah. No, absolutely. We got off tangent. I talked about the plot, but let me tell you what came out when this movie came out. I was going to say, there's that. something I wanted to point out. Sure, no that. problem. You, you probably are going to point it out to that too. All right. Uh, so <laughs> this movie came out on the 29th of September. It came out up against The Big Green, Halloween Curse of Mike Myers, Steel Big, Steel Little, that's the Andy Garcia movie, and Moonlight and Valentino. So if you're looking at those films in terms of what this when this came out, um, Devil in Blue Dress says, doesn't have that much competition on that week. The week before... You had the 22nd, you had seven, which was probably why this movie kind of got pushed a little because seven was a big hit. Oh, Showgirls, yes. uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation, and Empire Records, but they were both limited. Empire Records was limited, so I'm not going to really, I put it in there, but yeah. yeah. And and both both Texas Chainsaw and Empire Records has Renee Zellweger on it, so she was competing against herself that yeah. year, that week. Uh, the week after Devil in a Blue Dress, the 6th of October, you had Assassins. How to Make an American Quilt, Dead Presidents, and To Die For. And you are you saying that I'm going to talk about what came out on the 13th? No, I thought you were going to talk about the top 10 list of that week it came out. Oh, no. Because... Go ahead, go for it. it. Well, seven, seven beat it, obviously, came in number one sure. the second week. Uh, Halloween beat it uh, again as well. Then Devil in the Blue Dress came in third its opening week. But what I thought was interesting is Mortal Kombat, which we did in episode four, was in its seventh week. And it jumped from 14th the week before to 7th that week. Oh, wow. So I, I don't know why, why it got such a bump, but it got a big game bump come out. Week. Maybe a game came out that week. Oh, maybe. Maybe Mortal Kombat uh, 3 came out that week or something. Maybe. Yeah. That but could, I that thought that be. was really interesting. That is interesting. That's I didn't, a I didn't huge have that. jump that late. I only had the note that on the 13th of October, Strange Days came out, which we already also did an episode for. This is true. I always like, we always like to kind of like give you a, some episodes we had done already, like Strange Days and uh, Mortal, Kombat. Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat we did with our friend Russ Lyman. So if you know Russ Lyman or want to know Russ Lyman, <laughs> feel free. Um, all right. So one of the things that we both already talked about, the, the, big, the big thing that I liked about this was Don Cheadle in this. Uh, he's really good. He's got, some, he's got some good lines, but that's his character. That's the, the he's a really fun character. Right. Did you like the mystery? Or the the case, in, uh, what what he is work, what Easy is working on. Did you like that? Eh. Okay. I mean, I was cool with it. Well, you, I, I, it wasn't the most interesting case in the world. I thought his character was interesting, and the the world. It was a much different like noir world because of mm -hmm. his character and mm -hmm. what he was dealing with. Mm -hmm. I thought the that whole premise was very interesting, but I thought the case was kind of okay. Well, there's no there's no bad. <laughs> 
Albright's the bad guy. So Tom are, Sizemore plays the bad guy. There are no overarching villains, but there are bad people. But, but no one's like the main bad. But like Matthew Terrell character, which is supposed to be, which is more Chaykin's character. He's clearly the one that is behind the money that Albright's sh- shilling out to get Monet because oh, yeah. she has She's the pictures. The right. <laughs> so you show Terrell once, you show Chaykin once in the movie, and yes. then you don't ever show him again. Basically, they have the shootout at the end of the cabin, but it's with Albright. Terrell's not there. So there's no really like sense that they are going to get away with it, that kind of thing. Because you, ha- you do have the character of... Um, of uh, Todd Carter, which was played by Terry Kenny, which I didn't bring up before. He's uh, he's in Billions in the Firm and Mile Twenty Two. He was Monet's fiance, right? And yeah. he, and but you don't know that offhand. Albright comes in and says, "I'm working for Todd Carter," and he was like a mayoral candidate that quits, that leaves the race. And part of the reason why he leaves the race is they discover um, Monet. Basically, the 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 big thing about Daphne Monet is that she's her father was Creole. Creole. Yeah. No. No, her father's um, white. Father's, father's white. Her Creole. mother's Creole. So obviously that's a big you can't you can't do that back then. You you, you can't have integrated marriage in, in LA at that point, or that's a big, big no no. Yeah. Which, you know, obviously we all know is, you know, horseshit. So that was a big thing. And 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 so that was like this that's why he left the race. He he wanted to be with her. She was going to stay. Um, she they're gonna stay together, they're gonna be in love, but the family pays her off yep. to leave. But she thinks that once she tells him what, you know, hey, listen, this is what my story is. This is who I am, that he'll just take her back because they love each other and find out at the end that he doesn't. Then once she's able to get the pictures and right. have him, Tyrell, that's why she has the pictures to right. get Tyrell to drop the case. Because if she can get Carter back in, right. maybe he'll be like, oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm exactly. Good. She has pictures of Tyrell with kids and that's, she's trying to blackmail her way back into basically her fiance's arms and right. into that life. Um, but like, that's, that's at the end. Like when, when Carter's like, you know, I still love her. And it's just like, and he like, Raul is just staring at him. Like, yep. All right. Like, it's yeah, kind of sure like, yeah, yeah, exactly. If you, yeah, that, that's the line of, that's the line of bullshit because if you did, you yeah, obviously wouldn't be, her, yeah, exactly. you'd, you'd stay with her. You do whatever you could. Exactly. Um, so, uh, but I, but I do agree with you. The, it's, the mystery is interesting, but it's not really like uh, the idea of like he's in over his head he is but he's not really in over his head enough like he doesn't get the one thing i don't like about his uh easy rollins character in this is that he's very good at being a private eye even though he has no idea what he's doing as a private eye <laughs> you know he fought in the army yeah he's got right. the gi bill that's so how he got his house so we know he can he, he can work he, his way around guns and yeah stuff you know like he that, knows guns and yeah, probably yeah, had yeah, to yeah, take yeah, care yeah. of himself yeah yeah but his investigative skills are like fantastic and he automatically knows exactly how to inter- you, you, interrogate people. You almost talk. right. You almost want him to already be a PI in this movie. You know what I mean? I'd I'd like that. I'd like him to maybe stumble into things a little bit more, mm-hmm. get things wrong mm-hmm. a couple times. Well, to be fair, he I mean like he has sex with Coretta and her boyfriend's in the other room. Right. We get that he's a flawed character. Well, that's what I'm saying. There you go. I'm saying right now that he's flawed. He's somebody who and and there's actually a love scene between him and Monet in this movie that they cut. I'm glad they cut that. Yeah, I don't it didn't make, it, well, yeah. Franklin had the note where it's like it didn't really need it for the story, which I agree. It yeah. wouldn't it wouldn't have helped. That's just all right. But also that's also a, a very big, you know, that's your your morally gray hero. Sure. Which isn't just in detective series, but spy series as well with James Bond. You know, you got your Ethan Hunts, you got any of those kind of like people that cross the line or toe the line in terms right. of the law. I mean, that kind of like sleeping with married women and stuff, that's just kind of a a, a staple. Or a um, there's no goody two shoe PIs. Right, and you're not a PI because you're a good guy. You're a PI because you're you're flawed or you're you're a gray area type of guy. Yeah, you know? or yeah. if you're a monk, you just have OCD. <laughs> but <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So like that. But everything else is just like he's really just. I'm watching going. You're really good at this stuff, but why? How? Mm-hmm. Like I I would have liked something where like maybe which again they're they're basing it on a book. Mm-hmm. Maybe he was a cop for a little bit. I was torn off the force because, you know, because of his, the color of his skin, because maybe he stood up for, um, someone, mm-hmm. um, well, he would, I don't think he would have been, out, a, but he wouldn't have been a cop back then. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't I just, think so. It's just, he's just really good. Or he could have done like, uh, army intelligence. Okay. There we go. You know, he could have worked for the army, but he could have been like somebody who was responsible. Like, well, you don't know. Yeah. You don't know what he did in the army. So okay, I would have like, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a big, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give this guy a plug. He doesn't listen to this podcast. There's a book series that I read called uh, the Billy Boyle book series. And okay. it's written by James Ben. He's actually, he's from Connecticut and it's about basically, he's a detective from Boston who 
And he he goes to he goes gets drafted in World War Two, but through strings that are pulled by his uncle or he's like he's like his uh, Eisenhower is his quote unquote his uncle. He knows his friends of the family that kind of thing. Okay, he gets him put onto this like army investigative group where basically when there's some kind of crime being committed during the war, he would go in there and investigate with and it's it's really cool because it's going it's about 11 12 books in but it goes throughout the series of world war ii and he's basically he's investigating crimes but he's doing it within under the guise of the the military the army that's pretty cool so th- that something like that probably would have worked well here absolutely yeah i just you I know read those book series are really good <laughs> nice nice shout out <laughs> sorry like i just you know, that's the only thing that i didn't like about the um character of easy rollins other than that i really thought his character was cool um obviously he's denzel washington which doesn't hurt because denzel washington's cool and a great actor. Yeah, so. yeah no, he's terrible. <laughs> um, um, that was being facetious. I, I do like Easy Rollins' motivations in this film, though. I I enjoy his his quote. I didn't write it down, but I love his quote about you know when he first pulls into his house. You know, I just love the feeling of having a house, having some place yeah. to call my own, having a home. His whole reason for doing this whole case is just to have and keep his house. He wants. He, he takes pride in being a homeowner. And yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And and like yeah. when you see him in between the scenes, he's gardening, he's he's yeah. painting, he's fixing he's, up his house. He's it's yelling just, at the crazy man who wants to knock down his trees. Who, who, are the, did people really start doing that in the forties? Uh, like that guy's, I'm gonna take that tree and resell it or replant it. That guy's or? nuts. Let me knock down some trees. I'm gonna knock some trees. Easy. Yeah. Let me just knock to get, get away, away from, from that house. He's throwing rocks. At <laughs> I him. know. Uh, yeah, I, that guy's nuts. Uh, that guy's just. Oh, I mean, I shouldn't say that. It's probably inappropriate, but that guy's he is crazy. It's like. It's a weird, it's a yeah. weird thing to have in your neighborhood. Just this crazy guy. I want to knock down some trees. Uh, going back to um, Coretta, when when obviously Easy's, you know, they they have sex. What, um, one of the things I like that he he because he says it, but like he's trying to get information out of her, but mm-hmm. she's trying to get information out of him. Yes. So that's one of the things I like. That's another staple of kind of this noir mystery is like a clever woman, like somebody who is not like you know he's he thinks he's getting one over on her, but she, you know, he she realized did, that yeah. she was just trying to figure out how much he knew about Monet and why he was looking for her and all that stuff. So I liked that. I thought that was good. But yeah, no, I, like I said, I think it was slow to start almost yeah, like it didn't really know. It knew where it had to get in terms of the mystery. It just didn't know how to get there yet. And it, and it maybe was trying to set up other people in the story. I didn't get the cops. I didn't understand why the cops were even a part of this the guys that rough him up and they bring they racist cops. No, I get that. <laughs> That's what I had my notice here. Bad cop, racist cop. Um, I get that. But when they arrest him the second time, he's like, just give me a couple of days. Give me 48 I think hours it's to make it like, okay, now we have to solve this case. I didn't. I, I just, think that impetus needed to be at the beginning. Right. Maybe he only needs to meet the cops the one time and give him that motive. Like, I think that would have spit up the movie is you have a day, you have two days, give him that time limit at the start. Like, why did they arrest yeah. him the first time? I Because the cops were always letting on, seems like, you know, more than they let on. Well, I thought maybe they knew. Oh, well, they do make the, uh, Carter makes the comment that oh, you, you won't have any problems with the cops anymore. Kind of like stepping in, which means that was he the one that was telling the cops go after easy or was it, you know what I mean? Or, or go, was Terrell the one saying like lean on easy? So some somebody obviously no, or, was. Or easy just told him, hey, cops are coming after me. No, because oh, no, because yeah, because I'm I'm saying I think that maybe the cops were part of whoever was the mastermind behind the whole thing Tyrell at that point, right? But again, you don't we don't see that. There's no conclusion of that storyline because all it is is the Albright con- conclusion when they shoot him, when they kill right. him at the end. Yeah, which I actually like, really like when they kill him and they're standing over him and, and he's just watching and he's just dying down. and it's just kind of like he gone, like he's just like I just love that. I can thought. we talk about Albright for a sec? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh-oh. Stop casting Tom Sizemore. I mean, I know this is earlier <laughs> this on. This is the 90s, still, like, man. Every time he comes on and it's like, oh, yeah, easy. I'm a good guy. Let me shake this black guy's hand. Then he's just throwing out the N word later on because he turns out he's the. That's, what, that's my note. It's like Tom Sizemore is the asshole. <gasps> Surprise. Hold on. He's not the asshole in Saving Private Ryan. No, the one that's the one movie. Yeah. Every other movie. Well, what was it going to have in Saving Private Ryan? Surprise. Hail Hitler, and he was going to attack them. It's like every other movie, though, it's like yeah. it ruins it for me to have Tom Sizemore in a movie because I automatically know that that's my twist right there. That Albright's not a nice guy. Albright's the bad guy. Yeah, but guy. you have to know in 
you know he's hiding. But somebody. you have to know in a, like a mystery guy. type thing when a guy comes in looking to hire somebody. You have to know that he's not all he's shaped up to be. Yeah, but you could. I mean, again, I this get is based it. on a book series. Mm-hmm. He could have been the guy that trained Rollins to become a PI. Okay, that, that kind of gives yeah. the hints of you should be looking for this, this, and that. Someone who actually didn't mind that he was black and kind of trained him and mentored him, and then have Albright die, mm-hmm. and like so he kind of takes over the investigation. Which thing. the scene when he, the scene when he, those college kids come out and they they're getting on easy because the girls, the the white girls talking to him, right? And they were like, "What are you talking to him for?" And, and then he comes out and like. He beats the crap out of him. Let's get out of here. It's like you have that scene. Why to show racism back in that in, the, in that day? Okay, that's fine. Just just set that up. Yeah. Okay, I get that. You need even though it's a it's not a it's a well known fact. You still need to set it up for the movie. But you also see Rollins' attitude toward it, how he handles it. Is he's, sure. He doesn't want any part of it. But he's then why like, are you setting up some kind of camaraderie between Albright and Rollins so that we can be surprised ex- later? Ex- I think that's what it is. That's well, why Albright comes at it. That today. surprise that would be fine if. Albright didn't show up in his house the the couple of days later looking for like trying That's to pump your big reveal. Well, that shouldn't be the bigger. The big reveal should be the ending, the very end when they kidnap her or something like that. That should be the reveal because you're like, oh man, he was bad all this long because maybe he can still teach Easy. Again, we're rewriting this movie, which we don't like to do, but then maybe he could teach Easy, but still end up being the bad guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, told you, number one rule, Easy, don't trust anyone. Yeah, like stuff like that. Absolutely, which we've seen before. And again, we're which, re, we don't want to rewrite the movie. That we also hate works doing a little that. bit more because then you have that emotional gut punch of, oh man, what mm-hmm. is in this? You don't really have that. Mm-hmm. Also, don't cast Tom Sizemore because you just <laughs> automatically know that this sleazy guy is going to be the sleazy. But he guy. can do it well. I know, but I hear you saying it's over. That's like when you hire. Uh, how do I always forget his name? The guy who played the Grand Moff in Rogue One. <laughs> um, ben Mendelsohn. Yeah. That's like when you hire Ben Mendelsohn for anything now. You're just like, he's the bad guy. Christoph Waltz, he's the bad guy. <laughs> he's not guy. the it's bad guy like, on the outsider on TV. On. It's just like, you just know automatically in, in your in your story. I get you. I understand. I, but Ben Mendelsohn could say no to those parts. I'm not even like, let's say I get cast as that guy. guy I'm not You're going to, yeah, man, if I get cast as a bet, listen, if someone said to me, like, I really like how you play those bad guys. I really like how you play the jerk in those forgotten cinema commercials. I want you to play the jerk in this way. I'd be like, let's go. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> of course. That's the thing. It's I'm like, sure, I'll be a I'll jerk. You want to be a it's jerk. It's not Tom Sizemore's fault that he's being cast in these roles. Sure. It's that they well, keep overusing him in these roles. They don't say, maybe you can surprise the audience by playing this type of character now. Mm-hmm. And then maybe, you know, mm-hmm. we'll bring you, like, they overuse that. That character, that same actor and that same character type, mm-hmm. which, and then they try to play it off like it's a shock twist at the end, like in Strange Days, which came out just a, a couple weeks after this a movie. Tom Sizemore month in 95. Exactly. And boom. <gasps> his friend was actually not his friend all along. You want Sizemore? You got Sizemore. This Don't gonna, Sizemore. Anytime we have a Sizemore thing in this, it's always going to be something I point out. You should probably have like a Sizemore alert thing that goes on. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Sizemore, Tom Sizemore. It'll be a quote from going, I was the dick all along. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how about when Easy takes Joppy out of the bar? So he's, he figures out that Joppy's the bartender that connects Easy with Albright, but Joppy kills Coretta. Joppy kills Coretta. Yeah. Yes. No, not Coretta. Yes. Yeah, Coretta. But also kills the guy that was drunk in the bar downstairs. The guy was asking about Coretta. Yep. Okay. So you fig- so you find that out. So at the end of the movie, Easy figures out that Joppy's the only person that told um Albright where he lived or the number or the phone number or something like that. He's he's two, only two people that knew something about Easy that it was Joppy and someone else right. and Joppy's the one that told him. So he takes pulls Joppy out of the bar, takes him to the cabin, tells him where where's everybody? They're at the cabin. They go to the cabin, tells Miles or Mouse to, to hold on to him, kills him. So then it's like he comes back from whatever happened in the cabin and he finds that Joppy's dead. He's like, oh, but it's like here's the thing. They saw you take Joppy out of the bar. So when they figure out that Joppy's dead. Easy Rollins is the number one suspect because they saw you take him out of the bar. How do you get around that? Well, it's going to sound terrible, but he's a dead murdering black. Uh, oh, the black guy that, that murdered a white guy in the 40s. That, that's, that's, well, so who cares? Uh, I guess. Cover up the end. You don't think the mayor's going to cover up this whole entire uh, thing? Yeah, I guess. I guess when all you say it like murder, that. any yeah. of the deaths, any of that's going to get all covered. Okay, but, that, but the people in his community are going to know that he murdered Joppy. Let's put it like that. Let's yes. take, let's take, let's take the right. element of the law enforcement element out of it. What people know. And then they also are going to know that Joppy killed Coretta. Are they going to know that? I'm sure they will find okay. out. All right. Because then you've got, you know, Easy Rollins seems like a guy that a lot of people are friends with. Yeah. And like they're going to tell people and they're going to tell people that, you know, they, that guy killed Coretta. Mm-hmm. And then obviously Junior, you know, is going to vouch for, vouch for Easy and be like, 
that guy killed my 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 woman. Right. You know, <laughs> that guy killed Coretta. Right. Who was such a nice religious lady. Oh. Wouldn't wouldn't do anything. Who, to easy, but Easy got that spot. I like how I like how uncomfortable <laughs> Easy is when it's like she's such a, she just wanted me to be happy and Easy's like oh god so oh yeah yeah that's okay, I'm sorry. just eating those pigtails like oh, yeah. give me more which I, I've never had pigtails I'm kind of interested I do not want pigtails I'm okay I'm good I'm eating them I am a vegetarian so I don't know if anyone knows that so I'm not gonna be eating pigtails anytime soon I'll eat and even if I I'm sorry even if I what did he meet I would not eat pigtails. Well, just tails, dude. Dude, just come on, tails. come on, come on, come on. They're just tails. Are you sure they're pigtails? Maybe it's just slang for something. There's actual tails of pigs. Sure. I mean, if it's pig dick, I'm out. <laughs> well, Field looks up pigtails and sees if it is slang for another type of meat. Let's talk about, and this is uh, this is something I wanted to bring up no, this they're, episode. They're, they're pigtails. They're they're pig yeah, gross. I'll try them. Tails from the pig, yeah, Ooh, gross. No, oh, I don't want pig. No, I don't want pigtails, dude. That's Should gross. Be That's muscle just, just don't eat. Why you can eat pigs? <laughs> All right, a pigs a filthy animal. Bacon's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna bring this up last episode, but I wanted to wait until this episode. So now we have a, a our last episode where we did the nice guys. Where we did the nice okay, guys. Nice, nice job. At this point, we've done a bunch of detective films. Okay. I want to bring up how much they drink in these detective films. Okay. It, 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 that's another big trope in these detective films that that happens a lot. He drinks in the morning. He drinks at night. He's drinking bourbon all day. They drink bourbon like it's water, well, which is another thing. It's sure. like people in movies drink this this hard water. Drink liquor, and smoke. Yeah. Like with gulps. Yeah. Well, because it's, like, it's iced tea. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I like I like bourbon and whiskey as well, but uh, you don't gulp whiskey. If you gulp whiskey, you don't have an esophagus anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but man, the amount of drinking and, and, and nice guys, they drink a whole lot. And a lot of the other movies that we mm -hmm. watch, it's like. These guys are drunk by 12 in the afternoon. These guys should all be like Marsh from Nice Guys, just completely <laughs> sloshed walking around trying to solve these cases at this point. Well, I think it's partly, you know, put something in their hand for the scene, you know, what the setting is. Oh, you're drinking, you know, like just Bourbon? to give yeah, them something. Sure, to, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also tough guy stuff. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like that but kind of thing. It's something I really noticed after the last two movies is like, wow. You don't watch Mad Men, right? You never watch Mad Men? No, but I know that a lot. They drink, they a, lot. drink a lot. But, but that thing. becomes a plot point. It does. Like when they're drinking, but like it's always typical to find them on the couch, on their couch in their office at like two in the afternoon or three in the afternoon because they're hungover yeah. from, a, from a lunch. Like it's, that's just what it is. Like, oh yeah, it's all great when you see it. But like they show kind of like behind the scenes stuff where like, you know, they're, 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 they're hungover. They're drunk. They can't handle it. They got to go home early. You know, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. But they smoke a lot too. A lot of, I mean, that, but that's, that's the 40s too. You know, that's the you know, 40s. Yeah. But that's also another noir tro trope is to get that smoky room sure. and stuff like that sure you want to smoke a light you could tell it's kind of like a way to tell a lot from a person like would you like it's almost like a handshake in noir films is like how they handle lighting someone else's mm -hmm. cigarette what they give them and and how they hand off the light and stuff like mm -hmm. that something that i thought we could all relate to is and and easy has it at the end when he's talking to his buddy odell uh, on the porch when he's he asks him about miles or mouse <laughs> i don't know who, i'm gonna call him miles because he calls him miles in the movie he calls him Miles. yeah where you know you have this friend, even though you know he does bad things, and you know that he's will do bad things, but he's your friend, and he's somebody who will be there for you. Like, mm -hmm. will you still be friends with him? And Odell's like, well, you know, you don't have a lot of friends, you, you know, in this life. All you got is your friends. All you yeah. got is your friends. Yeah. So it's like that's something that, like, you know, here, like you know, we all have friends that are just kind of either screw ups or maybe <laughs> like you know they they cause more problems than they're worth, but. They're friends to you know you could call on them if you need help for something you know they would be there for you or they're there for you or they're always friendly with you and they like you you get along whatever it is yeah so that's like a difficult decision to make whether uh, you because because Miles is a friend who is a great friend because he will he comes in a second when you need help yeah he's like and he's like let's go let's do it and you know he's willing to kill and get free, arrested for basically life for you, you. Yeah. but he's really but he's you can't let him off the leash because he's dangerous. Yeah. So, but I think that's a lot of people can relate to that. Just having, a, maybe like we don't have friends that are going to kill people, but we say we have friends that are, you know, danger, yeah. not especially dangerous, when but, you're younger yeah. and you're in like high school and stuff, mm -hmm. you've got that one friend who's like out of control. And right. Right. Or a lot of, I think most people do mm -hmm. that one friend where you're like, Whoa, yeah. I, I thought, like hanging yeah. out with you, but not doing that. Like, yeah. I thought that's you hang out with me, not the other way around. Yep. Yep. I thought that was very relatable. Um, now I, I think it's a good jumping off point to talk about Miles slash Mouse. Sure. Uh, did you want to see more of his backstory? Because they kept bringing it up and you don't see anything. You get a brief kind of flashback in like a dream he has. Well, you get the idea of he left, Easy left Houston because they got in some trouble and Miles killed somebody. So he, or Easy killed somebody. He had to leave. Right. He, but he, but he got, he got in that scrape because of Miles. Right. So I think you got that sense that of their tenuous relationship 
do I, it's not his movie. That's the thing. Like that's why that's part of the reason why everyone, part of the reason why Cheeto does such a great job in this role because he's a good actor. Mm-hmm. But it's a really good meaty role. It's a it's a it's like almost like the quintessential supporting actor role where you don't have a lot to do. You you get you win every scene because you're making the funny quip or you're just kind of like you're you're not the straight man in terms of like Easy Rollins is quote unquote the straight guy. Yeah, you're out of control. You're on right. The edge. You're who you can, are watching you can for. exactly. You're there to shake it up and you shake it up and when you shake it up, people are like oh man, that's awesome. Like that's that's your role. So it's a meaty role to do. Yep. But you. Know, but let's be honest. It's not you know. You do need to be good at your job. You do need to be talented at acting to, oh, you to need do to be, that. You need to be somebody they want to. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. We wouldn't be talking about him really if he was like me. Yeah. Exactly. So no, it's not his story. So I don't. I don't really need more of him. They just brought it up too many times. Like you know, they bring it up with the bouncer. They talk about how you know. What about you and Miles? I know you killed that. Bro. I know you killed him. I know you killed him. How about when you killed a stepmother or something like that? Or the stepbrother, or right, stepbrother. right, right, just keep right, right. I didn't do it. I didn't do it, but you did it. But you did it. Like he's well known for this this thing, and they bring it up a couple times, and they have a nightmare about it. And then he calls Miles, and you get Miles in, and they don't really. Mm-hmm. He mentions, "I don't need you bringing me down like you did last time." Right. And I don't want to get in trouble. We're going to do it my way. You're too crazy. You're too unhinged. Which, by the way, thank you for saving my life. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's 109 minutes or 101 minutes. I get that it's a long 101 minutes, but I think just a, like a little bit more of what happened. A more of a reconciliation maybe before they left or something would have helped. I think, like I said, to start to start the cast, I think that I would have rather, I'd like to see him more in the sequel. Like, that's why I think this deserves a second movie. Because you need to. This movie's not bad enough that it, I mean, I get it didn't make money. I get that. Right. But it's not, it's still had some critical acclaim and it's good enough where I would have, I wouldn't have minded seeing a second season of. Easy Rollins and Miles and just like those two characters. And then maybe actually that's the only two characters you need. Those yeah, two a whole new case. After yeah. That. yeah. The, I would, that's fine. I'd want to see that. Sure. Uh, so, and that's, I think where you can probably fill in the miles stuff. Maybe he goes back to Houston, whatever, but that's where I would want to see. Yeah, it's, it's clearly, it's got a little bit of a sequel setup that I think. That's too bad because I think it would have yeah, been good. Yeah. I think, I think it, it deserved another, there's plenty of movies that are really like the first movie's not good and they're like oh i'm gonna do a sequel and it's like really yeah. so there are plenty of those we could have got one for devil in a blue dress we could have got a sequel for and that i think that the sequel regardless of whether this one made money or not the sequel would have made money because you're just at this point in 1985 denzel's career is just going up, up well, here's up, the up, thing up, up, because up, we just never gone down we just got off of a movie where the tomorrowland podcast where we talked about where denzel washington always does business always does business exactly and except in this and now we've done a movie where it didn't do business and I know that Denzel came out and said that, he, that this movie opened the same weekend of the, as the O.J. Simpson verdict mm-hmm. when he was found not guilty. Washington felt that that influenced a lot of audiences. To, I can see that. I can see that, too, to the tune of not have, but like not being a big hit. I don't know. I mean, I, we just talked. I just can't. I can't believe this movie didn't do business. I can't believe it didn't do money because it, because Denzel always performs well. I just don't get it. It's too bad. Because it's a it's a it's a decent movie. It's a movie that's worth watching. It's definitely it worth, worth watching. Worth what watching. what I think helps this movie is the the not so much the case, mm-hmm. but the the character and the fact that he is this private eye from in the in the forties where racism is rampant, mm-hmm. where no one wants to help him out, where no one believes in him, no one wants to talk to him. He's a different kind of detective because of that, because of his backstory. He's not he's not an ex cop. Which like we talk, I just talked about how maybe it would be better if he was an ex cop. But he would be a different kind of ex cop, regardless. He's a he's a black guy in the forties, in a in a in a in Los city Angeles. that you know hates and fears is him and 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 well, what he represents. Well, Los Angeles yeah. still trying to do the right thing. And you have Los An- and you have Los Angeles where it's not like like New York's like when you talk about New York's a melting pot. So yes. like New York is like just you know it's all those different cultures and all those different people from different backgrounds together living in the same city and i be, and yes there is still racism in the city of new york but yeah. i'm saying that it's it's a little bit it's not as maybe i don't think it's it's as pervasive incendiary no incendiary, incendiary as okay, in la yep. whereas la everyone goes out to la to have a better life but then you go out to la and it's just like it's not like we're in this together it's and it's more spread out it's separated and, and yeah. It's, yeah it's divided it's 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 all that and it's and like I said, it's more incendiary. It feels more incendiary out there. Yes. Um, in terms of you know racial strife and whatnot, especially back then and now too. I mean, what are we talking about? The racism is never going. It's never going away. There's people are going to not like people because they're different, regardless. Um, that's unfortunate, but that's how sometimes people think. And you know, we're not. I don't know what I'm saying, but anyways, it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so maybe maybe that's just kind of more of a powder keg, I guess. 
in terms of absolutely yeah that kind of that that theme and that subplot uh, out in LA yeah yeah because you get that in LA Confidential when they're just gonna they're gonna pin those murders on the three black kids because they're just they were there. And they're gonna, you know what I mean? They they just go raid them, and they're gonna, you know what I mean? Well, they just chase them down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what makes easy as a detective. And uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm gonna say I want to read them. I do want to read them, but I'll never, I'll probably never get to them. <laughs> I don't I would, read. I would be very interested in in reading those other easy Ros- Rollins novels because I think that would be interesting. Him becoming an actual private eye. The cops would never help him out with information. The cops would mm-hmm. never do that. And every time he would probably be accused of the murders he's investigating, which I think is a, is a different kind of an added amount of drama not just the racism element but the fact that i have to solve this case because if not now i'm embroiled in it like i talked about how in our last episode for nice guys yeah one of the reasons i like it is because the detectives become part of the, the case your private eyes I well think, we said that they're they influence the story yes. right rollins would not just be a quiet observer because i think as soon as he was involved in the case he would become part of every case he was in okay just because of the nature of society back then mm-hmm so I think that would be a very interesting twist in in reading those novels and stuff like that. Now, to prepare for the movie, Franklin had Denzel Washington read books by crime novelist Chester Himes. He writes hardboiled fiction. He's a he's a black American who writes hardboiled fiction. I'm surprised that you wouldn't have him read Mosley. Like I'm surprised like you would have him read somebody else. Himes is a, a great writer obviously, but like I'm just that that's surprising. Does that surprise you? That he didn't have him read any of it. Well, maybe, I don't. But like, maybe he also didn't want him to get too much into the book's character. Maybe he wanted Denzel to make be his, his own. Character. Right. You're also talking about the first Rollins case. You go if you read. Is Future this the first Rollins, Rollins case though? Because I didn't. Well, it's the first Rollins case in terms of this movie series. Okay. But maybe okay, yeah. Maybe okay. it's the cases from another book. So maybe he didn't want him to read ahead. Maybe there was the personal stuff about his life that maybe he didn't want to affect Denzel. You're gonna have a wife and kids someday, or mm-hmm. this and that, and that would affect the way. Denzel would look or deliver lines about his house and living out there and stuff like that. This is the first book. Okay. There's 14 books. Damn. I know. When they end, this is the first one. Uh, this Actually, the last one was uh, three years ago. Charcoal Drill. How many pages are they? They're probably... <laughs> are they quick reads? Or like, I doubt they, they are quick reads. Bond re- novels? They're Bond novels. Well, what is a Bond novel? Well, Fleming's Bond novels are, are shorter. This doesn't say. Like I'm on Wikipedia 700 here. 700 pages. I'm on Wikipedia. Well, uh, let's... I'm going to... Let me read the... Uh, like if it's like a quick pulp novel, that's cool. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to read, I'm going to, I'm just going to read the description of the first book Yeah, and you can kind of like see what they took from it when that set in 1948, Devil in a Blue Dress introduces Easy Rollins, a newly unemployed factory worker, let go from his job building aircrafts because his white supervisor found him uppity. Now they kind of show that when he's like in the, in the room and he's just like, listen, you yeah. know, I get a break. He's talking about how the, the, the white guys, you know, get, get off, but, but me, I don't like that kind of stuff. My name's not fella. Right. Right. Yeah, they, right. They even mentioned it. All you all have to do is apologize. And yeah. He wouldn't apologize. Well, he's yeah. Well, he shouldn't. He didn't need to. Absolutely. <laughs> Needing money to pay his mortgage. Easy agrees to search for Daphne Monet, the missing mistress of a wealthy white politician. No one is willing to tell easy just why so many people want to find Daphne and the trail leads him through the intersection of crime, corruption, and race politics in LA. In the course of the search, Easy reunites with his childhood friend, Raymond Mouse Alexander, a charming but maybe he doesn't say Miles. Maybe he just sees, I don't know, a charming but con- conscience- conscienceless stone cold killer recently arrived in LA from Houston. The events of the book set Easy on his new career as a traitor in outside the law of favors. So, and then the second book is like, takes place five years later, and he's a landlord and he owns apartment buildings and uh, he's, audited, he's being audited by the IRS. Hmm. Interesting. And he's married in the third book. <laughs> so, I'm, just, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go through all the books, but no, I mean, I'd read them. I don't know how long that book's probably like maybe 250, 300 pages. I'm sure if it's a, kind of like a pulp novel like that. That's what I'm saying. If, it's, yeah. if they're just short pulp novels, that's cool. Yeah. No. Um, no, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'd read them. I want to. I want to read anything. <laughs> go give me the, buy me these books for Christmas and then I'll read them. I'll buy the series. Right. But back to the movie though. <laughs> <laughs> So do you have anything else that you want to uh, finish up with? Because, I mean, I pretty much I've expended my fact knowledge and my movie knowledge on this movie. Mm. The sil- I'll take your silences. No. Oh, I like when they go to visit Compton. Oh, OK. I think that's cool. Like the, the, the I mean, the 40s set dressing is cool. I like that it's set in the 40s, but then they go and they go to visit 48 Compton, 1948 Compton. Mm-hmm. And it's just a series of it's like tense. Yep quickly made buildings and houses yep. and just it's like they're, they're cooking out of trash cans and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like it was, 
you know, you get, you get these movies about Compton in the nineties and stuff like that, obviously mm-hmm. with like um, NWA and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you see it in 1948 and you're like, wow, well, like this, that's well back then everything's being developed. It's all about land out there. Exactly. But yeah. you see how, you know, you know, black Americans were forced to live. Sure. You know, or at least uh, sadly, like where Rollins lives, where mm-hmm. the GI bill, you know, set him up houses and set him up. Yep. That's a nice place. But for the majority, like what I assume would be probably the majority of black, black Americans right there, I think that paints a really harsh picture and is actually one of the most telling things about, you know, 40s L.A., which you don't see in a lot of movies. They don't go to no. Compton in L.A. in the 40s and show that. Mm-hmm. And that was like, wow, I've never seen that before. That was an interesting look at history, semi-recent history. Well, you, how, sh- you know, black Americans have to live. You then. should look for the I photo. That was interesting. You should. I didn't mean to cut you off. I apologize. You should look for the photo collection uh, shades of L.A. because that's what Franklin looked at to kind of set the piece set like what it would look like, how he would shoot certain things. And you should look at for that because that'll show you all that stuff. The more real, the less glamorous, the actual, like the real, the real. Right, yeah. yeah. They also had to re- when he's sitting in the bar and they have the street behind him. Mm-hmm. OK, so that's supposed to be uh, Central Avenue. But um all that stuff doesn't exist anymore. Right. So they had to redress Main Street in downtown LA to look like that. So that is all built up. Like that is just all like they designed that entire thing, just the shot behind him when you see like, you know, I did. I really like Which that is shot. awesome. Yeah. I did like, because then it shows that that bar set is actually up in, mm-hmm. that, in that building. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. The production design is really good and the production design only adds to the movie. It only just makes the movie more kind of I want to say realism, but realistic, but like more like you can touch it. Like you're like, wow, you're really there. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I will say one of my favorite scenes for miles or for mouse that, that I, I thought I laughed the most at is when they're in the car with uh, Joppy mm-hmm. and mouse is ready to kill, kill Joppy before they even get to the girl. Like he doesn't care about getting to right. uh, save Daphne or anything. He just wants to kill Joppy. You kill Kar- and he turns around, he starts shooting uh yeah, shooting yeah. Easy's car and he goes, No, the girl offered to pay me seven thousand dollars for that picture. And then <laughs> Mouse just goes, Oh my god, oh my goodness, <laughs> yeah. oh my god, oh my goodness, oh my and he like just yeah. starts pulling out yeah. just, just going, Oh my god. Like, because that's like fifty thousand dollars. Exactly. Now. Yeah. It's yeah. like I, I thought I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Like he was so ready to kill him. And then he just goes, We gotta go. Yeah. At the end, he's like, Man, I always come love visiting you. You gotta get paid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Easy if you didn't want uh, I also love this line. Easy if you didn't want me to kill him. Why then you why'd leave? you leave him with me? I didn't have time to both save your ass and, and tie, tie him, him up, up at the yeah. same time. And I love the fact that like, told me not to shoot him. I didn't shoot him. I choked him. It, it, like Easy's like hiding behind the window, trying to shoot into the, and Mouse just walks right in. Boom, <laughs> boom, <laughs> just blowing him all away. It's like, damn. No, he didn't care. He's that's again, it's a great role. It's a great, it's a great performance. And you know, it deserved all the critical acclaim. Absolutely. I also thought it was interesting when we first meet Mouse, we finally see Frank, um, the oh, uh, Frank Green, he's trying to Frank ask for Green, it. Yeah, the gangster who sells um cigarettes and whiskey on the side. He just been, he's a, and stuff. Like yeah, a he's, he's a small time thing. yeah gangster. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I don't think he he doesn't have a single line. No, he doesn't. Which it's, I thought was really interesting. He probably just because he probably was not an actor. Maybe, but I thought that was really interesting. You you set up this character for all this time, and then you further set him up by saying that he's Daphne's brother. Yep, yep. or half brother. You don't you don't get a single line from the guy, and then he runs off. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. So if you haven't checked it out yet, you should. Um, it's obviously 40 years old, 30 years old, 35 years old, 25 years old, 25. It's made in 1995 to 2005. You're right. This is, this movie's 25 years old. Is, wow. Movie's younger than me. So, so I can't be older than me. Thank you for joining us at the 25th anniversary of Teflon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this movie should be a TCM classic. It should be up there. We should, I mean, it should be absolutely re release this movie. And there is no reason you can't do a sequel to this. Movie, well, I even mean, now. Man, but then it's old, Easy Rollins. I guess you could. You just ignore the fact that Devil in the Blue just happened. But oh. you can still, like, kind of mention it, but you don't have to. It doesn't have to be a direct sequel. I guess. I mean, let's see. Uh, Charcoal Joe, which is the last book they did, is set in May 68. So that's 20 years after. But you got it. Yeah. You easily said it then. Denzel still I mean, Mouse good. is still in that one, too. So there you go. Oh, wait a minute. No, wait. He is. He is dead. He is investigating. <laughs> He asked them to take a case. And why not? Then I guess they can do that. Absolutely. So you said it just on the, just during when Vietnam's starting. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go. Let's go. Let's, we'll do it. We're, <laughs> we're down for that. Forgotten Cinema's down for that. Denzel, just sign our contract. Well, you don't know us. <laughs> we're nobody's, uh, nobody listens to this podcast, but if you do, we're ready. So anyways, so like I said, Devil in a Blue Dress, we liked it. Watch it. 25th anniversary. Uh, we're pushing for the Charcoal Joe, uh, which is the second, the last book that he wrote in 2016. 
We're pushing for that to be a sequel. Make it happen, people. Oh, right. yeah. So why don't you let everybody know where they can find us? And while you're doing that, I will look up what we're doing next week. All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening to us, guys. Uh, you can listen to further episodes on our website, ForgottenCinemaPodcast.com. You can get links to all our old and most recent episodes. Uh, you can also find us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or iHeartRadio. Basically, we're everywhere podcasts can be found. You can also find us at social media at Forgotten Cinema Pod. We're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Mostly Instagram and Twitter is where you can find us. You can view our commercials we put out every week. We put out an episode every Wednesday, so make sure to join us for the next week's episode, which is... We're doing the 1996 horror comedy fantasy classic The Frighteners. Now... You may think that that's, that's not forgotten. We love that movie. But you know what? We don't care because we're doing it anyways. We think <laughs> it's forgotten because not enough people talk about that movie. So uh, join us next week. We're doing The Frighteners and it's going to be fun. We both like it. So it'll probably be another like, oh, this is great too. And oh, this is great too. So we'll try to find stuff maybe we don't like about it. But that's we'll really come hard. We'll come up with a lot of facts. I think there are a lot of hard pressed production notes it. about this movie. That's good. It's a, it's, it's a really good movie. And I'm hoping the effects hold up. I think they do. I mean, this is only tw another tw 25 year old movie, almost 24. I'm going to tell you right now. It doesn't? Then uh, some of them are not going to hold up. Why are you going to be a jerk? Why are you going to be a jerk? <laughs> the movie still doesn't, it doesn't matter. The movie's so good at. All right. So, so for jerk and face, he's really creepy. For so. jerk face and myself, we'll see you next week. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Field. I'm uh, Mike Butler. And this has been Forgotten Cinema.